Okay, hello everybody. And I come um, here to Pasadena, where I was before, from cities of Belgrade, Turin, Austin, sorry, <laughs> and Turin. Okay, I'm not a designer, and this is not going to be easy because I'm not even a wannabe designer. I never noticed what design was all about, you know, like most people don't really, you know, I take it for granted. But I did write a book, and it was called The Design of Crime, The Genocide in Srebrenica. <laughs> now, it's going to start, yeah. Now, uh, Srebrenica didn't become uh, the worldly notorious or famous because of the genocide just like that. It was a huge design of a mastermind of crime that stood behind it. When I first heard of the fact that 8,000 people were killed in three days and their bodies were hidden, buried and dismembered all over the region, in another week, I thought, how was that possible? Who did it? Who on earth could have thought of such a thing? And at that point, you know, the word design came to my mind. Because only that could explain something. And it wasn't the design of God, because, you know, I'm not a believer or anything like that, you know. I knew that somebody had to think about that, and somebody had to implement it. And at that point, I started being obsessed by the design of crime. Now, Italo Calvino is a famous Italian writer who died in 1986. He wrote speculative essays about the character of the 21st century. And he wrote uh, six memos for the next millennium in 1986. He didn't even manage to finish it because he died before. And he was a futurist and he was an optimist. And he wrote that lightness, quickness, exactitude, visibility, multiplicity, and consistency are going to be the characteristics of our millennium, of this 21st century we're living through. Now, the, he was utopian, but what I see here is that these characteristics were exactly what you could apply to the design of crime, to the design of genocide in Srebrenica, which was the biggest crime after World War II, after the Holocaust, unimaginable, in the middle of Europe, in the middle of peace. George Orwell, he was a science fiction futurist writer. He wrote about the basement of language. He wrote The Political Dystopia, 1984. And when he wrote it, it was far away from 1984. But you see, my daughter was born in 1984, and it was 27 years ago. And my daughter, for her, 1984, the novel of Orwell was reality. Her world in Serbia, the world she grew into, she survived, was just like 1984 of George Orwell. It was a world of hatred, of crime, of hunger, of guilt. It was like the new barbarism, really. Hannah Arendt, she was the most famous, I would say, political philosopher of 20th century. 
a German Jew who escaped from Nazi regime. She ended up in New York teaching a new school of New York. And she wrote this many famous books on violence, on totalitarianism. But as a reporter for New Yorker, she went in 1963 to Jerusalem to report on the trial to Eichmann. She spent days on end, months on end, listening to this man, to this mastermind of the biggest, biggest crime that you can imagine, you know, Holocaust, six million people killed without no good reason, just for being of another ethnic, you know. And what she wrote after listening to this man was that book which had the subtitle called The Banality of Evil, Eichmann in Jerusalem. Now, she was listening how he pedantly described his endeavor of obeying the orders of killing people just as he was told that every piece of that uh, master crime was execute, uh, executed perfectly, that the relatives of the victims would, guess, would get the uh, gas bills that was used for the victims to be killed. And that guy would go back home in the evening, you know, and he would sit with his wife, drink a glass of wine, pet his children, and behave as nothing happened, you know. And while she was listening to him, she had the same feeling that he was just a normal person, one of us. It could be anybody. It wasn't this, you know, huge monster somewhere from another planet, from science fiction. He was one of us, you know. He was one of her people. She was German too, you know. She didn't see the difference, except in the execution of crime. Now, when I went, uh, the movie you saw, you see, it was uh, a movie that the Scorpions, this paramilitary group from uh, Serbia, and I'm Serbian, and at that time I lived in Belgrade, and when those guys, you know, paramilitary groups are basically the same all over the world, you know, they're just guys who go to fight the wars of, out of many reasons, you can call it patriotism, you can call it loot, you know, they're just people who get armed and do what they're told, you know. But these guys, the Scorpions, were also backed up heavily by the Yugoslav army. Yugoslavia used to be a country, a federation of many peoples, ethnically different. We all lived together. We had children. We were in bed with exotic enemies, you know, and nobody ever thought that this thing would be a matter of major conflict, you know. And this pe the, the army of all the people all of a sudden became the army of one side of Serbian people, of the biggest and the strongest people. Together with the Scorpions, they went and they just killed everybody who was different, of different ethnic background, of different religious background, you know. It was something that happened all over the 90s, but this particular genocide thing happened in 10 days. So, not only they were interested in killing, you know, they were also, this is now the moment of 21st century, they wanted to film their deeds. They wanted to film the thing that you saw, like one minute and a half. They made the unedited version, which was 40 minutes long. And this unedited version was circulating for 10 years on end in video clubs. It was like the major hit. People were watching it, you know. People were bo getting boosted. Other people who wanted to kill other people. I can't even explain what happened there, but it had a huge success until this video cassette ended up in the Hague War Tribunal during the process trial against Slobodan Milosevic, who was the mastermind of crime, who was the Serbian dictator, who was behind all of these deeds. And at that point, the six scorpion in the movie got arrested, identified. They were brought to court in Belgrade, and. But uh, that court was exactly behind my house. You see, I couldn't resist at that point going like Hannah Arendt, of course, with new differences, to listen to these people, to hear what they had to say for themselves, to just... And this was beyond Shakespeare, believe me. I went for one year and a half. We were sitting in a very small courtroom. We were, like, breathing the same air. And what I found out was that these guys, you know, they, sp they look like my postman. They could be my relatives. Their wives were just like me. You couldn't tell the difference. They were one of us. They were, they were not somebody out there. They were the banality of evil. They made a choice, you see. They made a choice which somebody else did not make a choice. And it was also a designer's decision. 
The design of crime, this provocative, divisive language I lived through every day, had a purpose. This purpose was destruction and loot. There was a steady implementation of an unmoral and ethical categories, new divisions within civil society that encouraged discrimination and violence. This was done through the media we had in Yugoslavia, simple analog mass media, such as TV, billboards, street signage, and religious rituals. Now, these are the photos from the Serbian mainstream papers in the 90s. The photos that were pl published, somebody made a decision to publish these photos, you see. And this, this, this is exactly how our city, Belgrade is a three million city. It was a very sophisticated city, you know, until these people came in power. And it was like, like any European city, it could be Vienna, it could be Budapest, it could be Prague. And all of a sudden, you see, this is the church in downtown Belgrade. Oh, sorry, this is going too far. And these people, these photographs were actually implementing this kind of atmosphere where everything was possible, where you could, you know, kill your neighbor, you could, you know, mobile, draft a kid of six and take him to war and teach him some man's business, which is fight the war and kill your neighbor who is a Muslim. You know, that was like, and this is, the responsibility was of my country, of my community, in which I was taking part every day, and I felt guilt. I really felt guilt, and out of guilt, the only way to get out of it was to become an activist. Now, democracy and peace. When democracy comes, we, and peace, when we sign the peace treaty, I mean, everybody tries to get back to normality, and that's not easy, because, you know, it's very easy to lose it, but it's not very easy to come back to it. And we try to organize the gay pride parade, just, you know, to, 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 to say that we are coming back to normal society that was just like any other country. And what happened was the major... <laughs> okay. <laughs> we were persecuted for 24 hours by 900 hooligans. There were 20 people in the streets. The police were supposedly protecting us, but were actually not protecting us. Even the onlookers were attacking us because they were against this idea that uh, gays exist in Serbia. Meaning that first, the construction of the enemy was the religious, other the Muslim. The second step is that you have the construction of enemy is sexual differences. So this is, I mean, I have these images now. This is a long movie. I'm not going to show it to you, but you can, you can watch. I don't have much time. You will see, this is like downtown Belgrade. This is the police. And now the beatings are gonna start. You see the way they are dressed? You see the symbols they're carrying, national flags. You see who they're attacking? They're attacking young, unarmed people. And so on and on. Now, this is what I call war in peace. And last but not least, after the construction of the differences, you have the sexual, the sexual differences, you have the gender differences. Now, women have always been this huge abuse of women in warfare was legally invisible through centuries. Now, if you go to museums, you know, you will always see famous paintings, canvases, huge, you know, with like soldiers, and then you have nude bodies of women, you know, and you call it art, you know. Personally, I can't stand that, you know. It's because it's, and it's been like always like that. It was always taken as normal thing as collateral damage. Women's bodies are used in war as enemy of, uh, as territory of the enemy. And the pornography, of, uh, of war basically spreads uh, through peace, war as much as peace. And only after this last wars we had in former Yugoslavia, for the first time, uh, women, feminists, and rape women in war has raised their voice and managed to criminalize rape as torture and, and as crime against humanity. Before, if you would cut off a hand of your enemy, you would be uh, brought to trial as torture, but if you rape a woman, it would be just a collateral damage. It was completely invisible. So this is the big victory we had. But the pornography war has spread all over the planet. Like Italian media where I live today, 
is obsessed with publishing story of violence against women. Every day, the mainstream media publish a story of some young girl who is being killed, who is being abused by family, by priests, by friends, by whoever. And this goes like people are reading it with morbid details and the paper sells on that. It's like, really, it's a culture war on women and on, on their bodies, you see. The premier, Berlusconi, notorious premier who stepped down. He did step down. He stepped down because of the economic crisis. He didn't step down because of his huge sexual scandals with pro of prostitution and sex with minors. The Italian people, even who didn't like them, they said, well, every Italian man is dreaming of that. He's only doing what's in our head. So why should we, so, why should we be so biased? So it was kind of legalized, you see. And these are the pictures that were every day in Italian press. I don't want to sound biased, but these are the pictures where you see how the women are represented and you see how Berlusconi is. He's like tanned guy who is like on top of his game, you know. And this is somebody is taking decision to publish that, you see. Now, as an activist and a feminist, I will always say, not in my name, not over my body. And even in places like this, I know it's not pleasant to tell you this kind of stuff, but I'm using it to tell you something that really matters to me that I hope you will bear in your mind. And when you need to design a campaign, an object, an idea, a book, a person, think of the question, a key job, an old Latin question, who profits from this act of creativity and how? There will always be some commissioner behind you, fame and glory and money. But you have a choice. Never ever in your life we had the potent tools of internet and mass impact that we have nowadays on community. And we have much more responsibility because we can design war and we can design peace. We remember Oppenheimer. He never wanted to become the father of atomic bomb. And neither you want to become something that you don't want to become. Responsibility, ethics, morality. That is what design stands on. Those are your piling, that is the cement in your basement. Good luck to you all in facing the judgment of history. Thank you. Thank you.